Hello, my name is Adam Mielhausen. I'm here with the Indiana Green Party. Um, we're very happy to have Howie in town today um, and to be out here lifting a voice up to those that are uh, the most oppressed. Um, if you don't know about the Green Party, uh, we are an alternative to the corporate parties. We accept no uh, no big corporate donations from anybody, so we are beholden to uh, the people. We are a true people's party um, here in America. Um, and uh, what we want to do um, is, is stop all the wars overseas for oil and for profit, bring all that money home, invest it in the people, um, bring education, bring a clean environment, uh, bring a better tomorrow. Um, unfortunately, that's very unpopular with, uh, with corporations that want to profit. Um, so we're up against a big machine here and it's very tough, especially in Indiana, for us to be even on the ballot and to compete. Uh, one thing we were up against this year is we had to get um, over 44,000 wet signatures just to get Howie on the ballot this year. And they had to be wet signatures of verified registered voters in the state. And it had to all happen during a pandemic. Um, this had to be done before July. So it was nearly impossible. We reached out to the election division. We asked for relief and got no reply um, at all. Uh, multiple times, nothing, nothing. Not surprising again, because it's the Democrats and Republicans who are writing laws for our election. And of course, they're gonna write these laws in a way to keep them in power. And that's what we're up against. Um, but we're still here, we're trying to organize, we're trying to get the word out, um, build up an army, um, and, and go up against this thing. Um, so uh, greenpartyin.com, you can go there, you can read about our platform, you can sign up to volunteer. We need as many people as we can. Um, to, to actually fight this thing and to make a difference uh, for a better tomorrow. We're very happy to have Howie here um, again. So uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for putting on this, uh, this wonderful event. Test one, Bishop Greg, G-R-E-G-G, -G, middle initial L, last name spelled G-R-E-E-R. -E -E I am the president of Freedom First International. First of all, I'd like to start off by saying, today we are in a very critical moment in our U.S. history. Critical, why? Critical because not only is this election season specifically contested, but we are here, standing here in the midst of making history. And I can say for a fact that we are standing with individuals who are on the verge of making a change historically. This election season, this election season, 2020, is gonna determine what's happening in our communities around the country for the next 20 years. 30 years, half a century, 50 years or more. What is going on right now? And we want everyone to understand who is listening, who's gonna see the video, that over the course of the next few weeks, the choice that you make will be a choice that will change your life. Think about that. Will be a choice that will change your life. What's at stake? Well, we say humanity first, not America first. We say that today has to be a change. We say that, as Dr. Matt Harrington said, the gun policy, which has been on the, which has been on the ticket in different countries and communities, not just locally, but nationally and federally, we say that it has to change. We've seen carnage across the country over the last four to five years, right? Children being shot at schools, gun policy, where is it at? Who's defending the rights of the children? Who's defending the rights of the folks in Chicago, as Dr. Matt Har Harrington was saying, who basically are inundated with bullets. They live a lifestyle of similar to the wild, wild west. Who's defending the rights of the underprivileged people? We decided that we were gonna to put together an event to bring the attention of the 
unheard to bring the attention of true leaders to the country. And the 50 networks or more, hundreds of thousands of people who will be listening to this, who are listening to this, or who are going to listen to this, just understand something. Understand that critical is the day and age, and I have to. I hate to be repetitive, but I have to be repetitive because I have to say that very critical is this election. You heard me say that before. I'm going to say it probably three more times before I leave this microphone. And what we have to do is we have to start looking for leadership. Leadership, not just a blank ticket, not just someone who, because they're in a party, we blank ticket and we check them off. Some of the judges who have been on the ballot for 20 or 30 years, every time they say we don't change them and they basically are acting outside of the interest of the people. You can, that synergy is repeating itself around the country. Some of these folks need to go. We need to find people who are motivated. We need to find people who are aggressive. We need to find people who are interested in making change. So I'm gonna tell you something. With that in mind, interested in making change is the very critical definition because interested in making change is the individual who we asked invited to come here and speak today. Right? Right? Howie Hawkins, Green Party. Let's say something about Howie. Howie came from labor. We know that, right? Right? Correct me if I'm wrong. And labor has been critical to the building of what? Our communities. From the very beginning, it was labor that moved our country. Right? very critical for any leader to understand that process and that's where how we was bred out of labor someone asked they said are you endorsing the green party candidate and you know what i said i said no i said i am endorsing a leader whoever that leader is we need leadership and we i said you've heard me say it again everyone who's heard me speak in the last several years we use the word leader too generously. We have to be careful about who and what we call leader in our communities. We have to look for folks who are interested in changing our communities for the better. We have to look for folks who are interested in making a change, not just bringing justice to some of these issues in community, gun policy rights. Immigration is a huge problem around the country. Uh, the situation with political partisanship has gone way into the sewer, way into the gutter. Now we don't even care about what we do and we say to people, we don't care about human rights. We care about if you are on, in my party, then I will defend you, I will work with you, I will be a part of your structure, and we don't care about anybody else outside of our interest. Special interest has become the name of the game. Lobbies have become the name of the game. If I have 100,000 and I give it to your campaign, then hey, I got a good seat and whatever's on my agenda, I'm with you. I don't see that with Howie Hawkins. I had the opportunity to meet him about a year ago in a presidential debate, and I tell you what, at the end of the debate, he spoke. And what I felt, I felt and I discerned his leadership. So I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna go really, really far. I am a preacher. I am a man of God, a man of faith. And I stand on cause. So we don't endorse a political party, but we endorse leaders. So that's what we're looking for. And as we enter into a new world, a new day and age, that has to be the climate and the benefit and the change that we need to see. If we start finding leaders, I don't care if it's in your local automatic or trustee or a it could be the block club captain. A block club captain, as I've said many times before, can probably do more for you than the president of the United States right now in this day and age. And I don't want to put down that position because that is a very great honor and it's a very astute position, but we want the president to be the president for the people, by the people, and be the president of the people. Power to the people is a serious concept. We can't let that go in the days ahead. So when you are going, the last thing I wanna say is when you are going to your ballot and you're standing in that two hour line, understand what the democracy, what that process is all about and what it means to stand in that line because there are people around the world who don't have that benefit. There are people around the world who can affect change the way that you can. And don't listen to those naysayers or those folks who say, that 
the process is just a, 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 a protocol that the electoral college is going to decide. Well, maybe that is process. That is part of the process, but what I also say is that with that process, you participated in what is fundamental democracy. It's fundamental to who we are. It's how we came and where we came from. So I want to say this, and if you're listening, everyone who's listening, we must not stop in our efforts to bring justice to all the people of the world, bring justice to this nation, bring justice not only to Madison Avenue or Wall Street, but don't forget about the ghettos. We have to keep our head to the sky and our eyes on the prize. And every day that you breathe gives you another reason to try. And as we enter into a new world, a new day and age, we have to seek that change. And it starts with leaders. I am proud to stand here with Howie Hawkins. I am proud to stand next to this gentleman. And in the days and year, months and weeks ahead, whatever happens on November 3rd, I can truly say that I stood next to a leader and I want everyone to look at this man. I want you to take a look at his policies, listen to his speech, listen to the things that he's saying. Really give him a, 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 a shot because I tell you what, I can discern personalities, I can discern spirits, I can discern characters and I will give Mr. Hawkins an A plus. And I'll tell you what, I look forward to working with you, sir, in the days ahead. And freedom first, if I can speak for the board members who were here, freedom first backs you. So today we have the opportunity to welcome on this very ground, on the capital of Indiana, Mr. Howie Hawkins. It's my honor to be here with you. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. this together here today you know I'm in this race and the Green Party's in this race because real solutions can't wait we're facing life and death issues today we had another record number of people come down with COVID-19 we're eight months into this pandemic and I think what it shows is that the two governing parties in this country are presiding over a failed state all over the Pacific Rim, all over Europe, countries in Africa, Southeast Asia have suppressed the virus. And here it's the pandemic is raging. It shows Donald Trump is a dummy. He could have been running on this if he'd listened to the public health advice. Instead, he's worried about the stock market and wanted us all go, all go back out and die for the Dow. He's a loser, COVID won. But what about Joe Biden? He lives within commuter distance of the White House press corps. He used to take the train down to uh, the Senate, live in Wilmington, Delaware. He could have convened the White House press corps and done news conferences and said, this country needs to do what the other countries are doing. It's very simple. Ramp up testing, contact tracing, isolate those exposed and infected, that suppresses community spread and we could be back to work and school safely. Instead, eight months into this thing, we had record numbers of people in the last two days come down with COVID-19. So that's one reason we're running. That's one life or death issue. I'm gonna give you five of them. Next one we've been talking about, you know, gun violence in Communities where poverty is concentrated, and that's where you get street violence concentrated. Yeah. And then we also got police departments that don't respect some communities. In fact, they're set up, it tends to be democratic machines. The police do what they were set up to do by those machines, and behind them is the real estate industry. And what they do is police the new Jim Crow lines, the school district lines, the municipal lines, to keep downscale people, particularly black people, down and out of those upscale communities. That's why they harass low-income people in poor communities who are low-level offenses and even non-criminal behavior. And that's got to change. So what Angela Walker and I are saying is it's not enough to say we got to change use of force policies. That's fine, but remember, Eric Garner got suffocated 
by a chokehold 20 years after chokeholds were banned in the New York Police Department. That's because the police police themselves and they cover up their crimes, their assaults, their murders, and rackets like civil asset forfeiture. In a lot of cities, they're in on a drug game too. And so what we need is all these commissions elected by the public, or I think better selected like juries by lot. You get a real representation without the politics interfering. And we're not talking about these review boards, which the politicians pick, and we really don't have much power. We're talking about real control. So these commissions can hire and fire the police chief. They can get rid of the racists and the sadists and the forces. They can oversee budgets and policies. And then when there is misconduct, they can investigate and discipline independently of internal affairs and police department. That is a key demand. We talk about defund the police, where they mean take some of these bloated, militarized police budgets and put it into social service that people need. You know, a homeless person doesn't need a vacancy charge, they need a home. And somebody who's addicted to an illicit drug needs drug treatment, not a drug charge in prison. And somebody who's having a mental health issue doesn't need a clueless cop with a gun who doesn't quite know what to do and may do something, you know, violent. You need mental health experts. The problem is there's not enough money in the police departments to provide those services. So as part of our Green New Deal, which I'm about to talk about, we have a program to invest in homes and jobs and health care and schools in communities, particularly racially oppressed communities that have been segregated, discriminated against, and exploited for generations. And this Black Lives Matter movement is very hopeful because a lot of young white people came out and said this is wrong with the people of color and we're supporting those movements. The problem is all we're doing right now is demanding new support. So that's why we need another voice in this debate and that's why we're running. So that's two life or death issues, the COVID-19 and the pandemic of racism, which has been around for centuries in this country and still not solved. And then we got a climate meltdown. That's where the Green New Deal comes in. We have a plan. We got the only plan really in the country. We got a budget that would be $27.5 trillion over 10 years, employing 38 million people to care for the people in the planet. It's not just needed for climate recovery, it's needed for economic recovery now in this COVID depression. And it emphasizes public enterprise planning and planning in particularly the energy transportation and manufacturing sector so we can transform all our productive systems to 100% clean energy and zero to negative carbon emissions in a decade because that's what the climate science says we got to do. You all heard Greta Thunberg. Sometimes it takes a child to like boil it down to the essential points and tell the adults what's going on. And as she told the UN, that last report from the International Panel on Climate Change said we got uh, 640 gigatons carbon left in the global carbon budget before we blow past 1.5 degree rise in Celsius, which is a danger threshold. And we burnt, so that was two years ago, we emitted 42 gigatons carbon each of the last two years. So we got eight years left before we blow through that budget and nothing's happening in any country, particularly the United States. So that's why we need a Green New Deal. And you know what, the people want a Green New Deal. And as part of our Green New Deal, we've always had an economic bill of rights to end poverty and economic despair. That includes the right to a job, government as employer or last resort, scale up the Works Progress Administration we had in the Great Depression, so everybody willing and able to work can get a job. If you're unemployed, can't get a job in the private sector, you go to the employment office, not the unemployment office, and say you want your job. And local communities have planned social service projects in infrastructure or public works, cultural projects, you know, murals. We can put musicians back to work. There's all kinds of things. We did it during the New Deal. We just got to scale that up. So the right to a job, the right to an income above poverty, build that right into the tax structure. If you're below the poverty line, government sends you money to bring you up to the above the poverty line. So we end poverty. Medicare for all. We need that more than ever in this COVID pandemic. Housing. We should expand public housing so everybody has an affordable housing option. Lifelong public education from pre-K and child care to post-secondary college and trade schools. And then our seniors, we need to increase social security benefits so people can actually retire when they become seniors. 
right now, too many people got to work till they drop dead. And there are people living with seniors in poverty. The, the Social Security benefits should be bring them up above poverty. Those are the six rights, jobs, income, healthcare, housing, education, and retirement. And then the issue that nobody's talking about from the major parties is this new nuclear arms race. Yeah. The United States started deploying new strategic weapons and new tactical weapons, started under Obama's, continued under Trump. The bullets in the atomic scientists has their doomsday clock, the closest it's ever been to midnight. And that clock goes back to the 40s. And we've had a lot of crises, like the Cuban Missile Crisis. They got it closer to midnight now. That's a life or death issue. And so what we're calling for are peace initiatives. Let's cut the military budget. We're saying 75%. Let's bring our troops home from these endless wars. U.S. troops are, combat troops are in 14 conflicts right now. Most of us couldn't even find those countries on the map. We know about Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and maybe Libya, but what about Cameroon or the Philippines? I mean, we're all over the place. We have 800 foreign military bases. We got a global military empire. With our wealth, we should be the world's humanitarian superpower and make friends instead of enemies, provide aid instead of arms. And what we want to do is with tensions reduced as we make that transition, go to the other nuclear powers and say, we want complete and mutual nuclear disarmament because those nuclear weapons should never be used. Because if they are, it's the end of all of us. Three years ago, 122 nations agreed to the text of a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And yesterday, the 50th country, Honduras, agreed, ratified that treaty. Now it goes into effect for those that signed it. And it's called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons got the Nobel Peace Prize for that. And I'll be damned if you can find more than a handful of people in this country that even know that. Because the two major parties are committed to this deployment of new nuclear weapons. They call it nuclear modernization. And nothing that those major parties don't talk about gets covered in the mass media. So we got a serious problem here. And so that's another reason we're running. What third parties have done historically, going back to the Liberty Party, when the Whigs and the Democrats wouldn't touch abolition, Liberty Party rose up in the 1840s and say, we need to abolish slavery. And that evolved in the Free Soil Party and then the Republican Party, and we got it. And then the populist parties in the you know, second half of the 19th century, the Socialist Party in the early part of the 20th century brought forward policies that were adopted by the major parties in time. So, but our goal is to go beyond that. We don't just want to give them good ideas, which they implement in a half-assed way. We want to get Greens into office. We got a hundred Greens around the country. We should be elected thousands if we go into the 2020s, which is the second objective of our campaign. Besides putting these programs out there, and I have to say, you look at public opinion polling, you talk about Medicare for all, Green New Deal, ending the endless wars, we got the most popular program. Biden and Trump oppose all those things. And we're not in the debates. We're not covered in the national media. And if we were, you know, I might be really on the verge of winning this election. But what we're trying to do, and what is more realistic, is getting ballot lines. I'm going to talk about Indiana in a minute, because Indiana is really tough. But in the 40 of the 50 states, the number of votes we get determines whether we got a ballot line through the next uh, election cycle. And that makes it a lot easier for us to run local candidates. This country's off the charts. You wanna run for Congress in this country? You need thousands or even tens of thousands of signatures to run as an independent if you don't have a ballot line. You wanna run as an independent for the House of Commons in England or the UK? It's 10 signatures. You wanna run for Congress in India, the world's largest electoral democracy? It's two signatures. <laughs> It's two signatures in New Zealand. It's 50 in Australia. It's 100 up in Canada. Except in the rural districts, it's 50. In this country, it's thousands or tens of thousands. In Indiana, it's the worst. To run for Congress as an independent, it's over 40,000 signatures in a congressional district. And then people wonder why. Well, why do, why do Greens only run for president? Well, in fact, we got over 200 candidates down ballot around the country, but not for Congress in Indiana. So. One of our objectives is this doesn't stop on November 3rd. And we want to help Indiana do what they got to do to get a ballot line and also change these laws. For example, first question I get from 
the press is, why are you spoiling the election for Joe Biden? And I say, no, Joe Biden and the Democrats set up the possibility of a spoiled election because we've been giving them for 20 years since Ralph Nader ran the solution to the potential for spoiled elections. I mean, we get losers like Donald Trump and before that, George W. Bush lost the popular vote and the Electoral College put him in there. And it was only close because we have massive voter suppression. There's 17 million people going into this, ele into this election who've been purged from the voter rolls. Right. The Supreme Court got rid of the pre-clearance provision mm -hmm. in the Voting Rights Act. And right away, these crazy Republicans passed these laws making it harder for low income people. They got photo ID, for example. And you know, if you live in the inner city and you don't have a car, you use public transportation, you don't have a driver's license, you don't have photo ID. Uh, if you're a student, where they're likely to vote Democratic, Madison, Wisconsin, or Austin, Texas. Student ID won't get you in to vote. You gotta have a gun permit or a driver's license in Texas. <laughs> you know, and that's the games they're playing. But you know who else is playing that game? It's the Democratic Party. Think about it. They knocked us off three ballots. We had two to three times the number of signatures we needed. Montana, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. I won't go into details. But they broke the law to get us off the ballot. And every, everything that was done by the election boards and the election commissions and in the courts was partisan. They got partisan hacks for both parties administering our elections. There's no other country that's got an electoral democracy where the parties that govern administer their own elections. They have independent, nonpartisan agencies administering fair elections, but not in this country. So they knocked us off the ballot in New York. They tripled the number of votes we need this election. That party, when the New York Times found out about it, they called it the Democrats' secret plan to kill third parties. They don't want the competition. They don't want democracy. So this is a this is a real fight for democracy. So our solution to the presidential thing is to get rid of the electoral college and have a ranked choice national popular vote for president. That way you can vote your first choice and not worry about helping your worst enemy. We've got it in Maine this election. It's on a ballot for uh, ranked choice voting in Massachusetts and Alaska this election. It's in 23 cities and counties across the country. So this is an idea whose time has come and we're gonna bring it to Indiana too. And uh, so there you have it. Those are the you know, key issues that we're raising. And then, you know, we're trying to get on a ballot so we can, uh, you know, elect thousands of people. And we're gonna do it like the way the Republican party. You know, when Lincoln ran, they think he was a third party candidate. He was actually a first party candidate because the Free Soil Party and the Republican Party was building up a caucus in Congress throughout the 1850s. 1858, the Republicans were the largest caucus in Congress when, when Lincoln ran in 1860. So that's what we got to do, build it from below. And uh, it's going to happen here in Indiana too. Indiana is close to my heart because there was a Hawkins farm down there on the border of Indiana and Illinois in the early 1800s. They lost the farm in the 1950s, but the Hawkins came across the river with the Lincolns because they, their land was swindled from them in Kentucky. <laughs> and a great, great uncle of mine went horseback and got a deed signed by, uh, I guess it was Andrew Jackson to, to you know, get that land for sure because they got swindled in Kentucky. So I've never seen that farm. One, thing, one of the things I want to do is go see where that farm is and see, you know, where my people were. It's down by Terre Haute. So uh, maybe next time, you know, because this don't stop on November 3rd, November 4th, you know. Look, the way it looks right now, if the vote is counted, and we got to make sure it's counted, we got to protect the election, Biden's going to win in a landslide. But he don't have solutions. Green New Deal, he's opposed. Medicare for all, he's opposed. Ending the English wars, he was saying the other day, he may increase the military budget. So... Donald Trump's got to go, but, you know, then we get Biden, we still got problems, and we're going to be here fighting for real solutions because real solutions can't wait.